Today, I'm Vino Dilaton. I consider myself a wizard, just a man with skills that can seem magical. The skills I practice are in the production and control of light, skills that have ancient history and current innovation. The oldest known production of light by man is fire. The combustion of materials, which is most often hydrocarbons, rapidly oxidizing, resulting in carbon dioxide, heat, and light. A single flame can seem simple enough, but inside there is a multitude of molecules and atoms vibrating so rapidly they emit light known as incandescence. However, incandescence isn't the only mechanism at work. The atomic emission of photons in a flame can also occur. This happens when free atoms of an element become excited by heat and electrons in these atoms jump from their ground state or one valence band to a higher valence band, referred to as electron excitation, and back down. Salts made with various metals can produce colored flame this way as the metals they contain emit different spectral lines, such as red for strontium and green for copper. The production of fire by means of mixing ingredients, such as potassium permanganate and glycerin, predates the term chemistry and has a long history in alchemy. The ability for man to control fire and its color made it not only for practical use, but also for its aesthetics. We eventually took to the sky with those capabilities and joined the stars with light brighter than the moon and more colorful than the sun. This form of entertainment is hundreds of years old and will be around for hundreds of years to come. The introduction of electricity led to many other ways of producing light one of the oldest being an arc between two carbon rods. Just like in a fire, the color is produced mostly by carbon that is hot enough to produce incandescence. Another way electricity is used to make light is by passing a current through a material. Electrons flowing through a conductor generates heat through friction. This eventually led to a more effective light source. However, at first, this method had a very short runtime. The trouble with most materials is that they oxidize when extremely hot. In order to extend the lifetime of the filament material, a clear glass dome was placed around it and the oxygen inside was evacuated. This led us closer to the modern era and the light bulb eventually spread its light out across the planet. The impact of the incandescent light was enormous, and its capabilities provided light for most applications that required it. Another innovation that improved the incandescent lamp was the use of halogens and a tougher quartz glass dome. With these improvements, brighter output and higher power density was made possible. The introduction of electricity also allowed for the production of light through the electrical excitation of gases and other vapors. Each element's atoms spontaneously emit different colors depending on their size, electron configuration, and level of excitation. Neon is a commonly used gas for creating light as it produces an orange glow when current is passed through it. The gas krypton produces a whitish glow when electrically stimulated. Metal vapors such as mercury also produce light when electrically excited through spontaneous emission. Isotopes of elements such as deuterium are used for producing light needed for specific applications.
The output of gases and vapors can change significantly depending on the properties of the electrical current applied to them. This is a Xenon flash lamp using 3 MHz alternating current as its power source. This is that same Xenon flash lamp using a high voltage, low current source, which makes wispy purple arcs jump between the electrodes. When the current going through the Xenon flash lamp is raised, a brighter and more white arc is established between the electrodes. Many modern incandescent lights now contain an inert atmosphere and not a vacuum. These can also be excited electrically. The krypton in this light bulb can be excited to the point of incandescence through radio frequency pumping. This light bulb only has a single wire attached to it and the light is not produced by current passing through the filament, but instead the oscillating electric field causes ionized materials not only to produce atomic spontaneous emission, but also enough heat in the filament to make it glow. Quite a few incandescent light bulbs also contain argon and can be electrically excited with high voltage alternating current. They work just like plasma globes do and are a lot of fun when excited by a Tesla coil or other high voltage, high frequency power sources. Another way to produce light is through fluorescence, a photo excitation down conversion process where a photon excites an electron from its paired electron in a molecular structure to a higher energy state, referred to as the excited singlet state. The electron then drops back down to its ground state, releasing a photon. Because there are losses in fluorescence, the photons emitted are less energetic and have longer wavelengths. For example, using 365 nanometer ultraviolet light to pump fluorescent results in a bright green output of light. Rhodamine 6G is another fluorescent dye and glows a nice orange when excited by ultraviolet light, but it can also be excited by green and blue light as well. Another variant of rhodamine is rhodamine B, which when excited, produces a deep red-orange light. Coumarin is another dye that is often used because of its ability to produce a bright blue light when excited. Powdered dyes that transform liquids into fluorescent mixtures are far from the only light activated ingredients available. Phosphorescent materials are excited in a similar way to fluorescence, called the excited triplet state. Here the electron also does a forbidden spin transition, which creates a delay in emission known as persistent luminescence. Phosphors include both fluorescent and phosphorescent materials, and not all phosphors react to the same light. The top two are yttrium aluminum garnet doped with cerium mixed with other metal oxides. The middle is strontium aluminate doped with europium, dysprosium, and ytterbidium. On the bottom from left to right is yttrium oxysulfide doped with europium, calcium sulfide doped with cerium, zinc sulfide doped with silver, a mix of three phosphors for white, and zinc sulfide doped with copper.
These indicator bulbs are a mix of mercury vapor and phosphors. Electrical current stimulates mercury atoms, which produce ultraviolet light. This light excites phosphors that are coating the inside of the glass. Different phosphors are used for different colors. White light is produced by a mixture of phosphors, and many fluorescent lights look like this under high magnification. Electroluminescent materials that work with phosphors such as zinc sulfide, dopes, or copper are excited when electrons flowing through the material collide with electrons in the material, which drives fluorescence. Another way to use high energy electron collisions to cause fluorescence is through the acceleration of electrons. This beam of accelerated electrons is often called cathode rays. In the base of the tube, there is a filament that is similar to an incandescent light. When current is applied to the filament, it produces a cloud of unbound electrons around it. These electrons have a negative charge. After the filament, there are two stages that have a positive electrical potential compared to the cathode, where the electron cloud is. Since the electrons have a negative electrical charge, they are pulled through the positive stages and gain momentum. These electrons collide with the phosphors in the front to produce light. Cathode rays have another property besides their ability to excite phosphors. They also respond to magnetic fields, which led to cathode ray tube displays. Before I tell you about the now most common method of producing light, I must tell you about an even more astounding method of producing light, the laser. This helium neon laser contains electrically excited gases. The light producing material of a laser is called a gain medium. In a gain medium, more electrons need to be excited than not. This condition is known as population inversion. In a laser, some light is reflected through the gain medium between specially coated optics. When a reflected photon hits an excited electron in the gain medium, the electron will drop back down to its unexcited state, releasing an identical photon with the same properties. This is stimulated emission. Breakthroughs using laser light in science and industry created demands for smaller and more efficient lasers. This was achieved with semiconductors such as aluminum, gallium, indium phosphide as the gain medium. Semiconductor lasers have become hundreds of thousands of times smaller and more power dense than their gas laser predecessors. The use of semiconductors to produce visible light sparked another innovation in light we all use today. Visible semiconductor lasers led to the lead emitting diode and many still use aluminum, gallium, indium phosphide as the active medium. When current is passed from the n-type to the p-type portion of the material, electrons leap into holes in the p-type. The motion of electrons traveling from N to P-type in the band gap, from conduction level to Fermi level, generates photons. New light emitting diodes often use indium gallium nitride. White light LEDs are now among the most common sources of man-made white light. They are a mix of technologies, as the semiconductor itself makes blue light that excites a phosphor. Usually, yttrium aluminum garnet with cerium is used, which is on top of the semiconductor. Multi-chip LEDs using multiple semiconductor dyes with different chemistries that produce a wide range of mixed colors in easy to use form factors are now available and a vital piece of magic for any light wizard. With these, shifting sources of vibrant colored light can be produced in all quantities, both small and large. Even the most delicate semiconductor light sources can be powered in unusual ways with the proper knowledge and skills.
Optics are also incredibly important when working with light, and mirrors are some of the earliest objects humans used to control light. In a mirror, specular reflection occurs, which is a type of reflection where the reflected photon is equal to the angle in reference to the surface as the incident photon. When a photon hits a smooth and typically metallic surface, it causes free electrons in the material near its surface to sympathetically oscillate with the same frequency as the photons. These excited oscillating free electrons then create electromagnetic waves themselves. When their waves interact with the waves of the incident photon, they create a reflected photon. Changing the surface geometry of a mirror allowed for a wide control over the directionality and shape of light. Some of the strongest and most power-dense directional sources of light owe a lot to the invention of the mirror. Modern-day examples are searchlights, outdoor spotlights, and video projection high-intensity discharge lamps. Learning about the physics of mirrors makes you appreciate the reflection coming from one. Lenses are another vital optical component used in modern optics, but their history dates back thousands of years. A light wizard might just have a crystal wall. Transparent spheres can concentrate light down to a powerful spot through refraction. Refraction occurs at the boundary between mediums of different densities. When light travels from a rarer to a denser medium, it's slowed and its frequency is slightly higher in the denser medium. If light enters a different medium at an angle, its propagation direction changes to compensate for the change in speed along the photon's wavefront at the boundary. Lenses that converge light are referred to as having a positive optical power, while lenses that diverge light have a negative power. Refraction only explains what happens at the boundary point of mediums. However, light traveling through the medium itself makes some electrons excited as they pass through. These electrons lose that energy by making electromagnetic waves themselves, which interact with the remaining electromagnetic energy from the incident photons. This continues the propagation of light through the medium as a quasi-particle known as polarotrons, or the sum of the energies from both light and matter. This makes lenses and transparent mediums far more interesting than they seem. Prisms also work by refraction, however, unlike lenses, lack curved geometry. Since the wavelengths of light are different, longer in the reds and shorter in the blues, there is a slight difference in their angles of refraction. This results in a split spectrum of light. Sometimes this can be seen in lenses, called chromatic aberration. Prisms not only refract light, but also reflect it through the process of total internal reflection. This is where the electromagnetic waves within the material hits the boundary line of the material and creates an evanescent wave along the boundary line, which interacts and redirects the waves in a similar behavior to specular reflection. Another way to split light is through refraction. This happens when the photons sort of bend around small objects or pass through very thin slits or openings. A very fine wire screen diffracts broad spectrum light by affecting the wavefronts of the photons and causing them to deflect and interfere with one another at different angles based on their frequency. Diffraction gratings use very fine surface geometry called lines to diffract light. These lines are usually cut into plastic or glass and show spectral lines and the general composition of light very well. Mirrors, lenses, and prisms made many things possible for humans, such as astronomy, microscopy, and spectroscopy.
Another property of light to exploring control is polarization. One of the most common ways to do this is with polarizing films. Typically, these are made from polyvinyl alcohol, which has been stretched during manufacturing. This gives the material a grain structure in one axis, forming molecular chains of polyvinyl alcohol. The material is also doped with iodine. Electrons in these chains will absorb light and convert it to heat, or allow it to pass with a higher degree of linear polarization, depending on the incident photon's electric field angle in reference to the chains of polyvinyl alcohol. Liquid crystal molecules can alter the polarization of light when pressure is applied, temperature changed, or by passing an electrical current through it. Liquid crystals used in displays change from a spiral stack formation to columns when an electrical current is applied, changing the optical polarization between polarizing films. Polymer dispersed liquid crystals are randomly oriented and scatter light but align when an electric current is applied, which passes light. Liquid crystal technology can be found serving many roles in working with light and are a major part of putting the properties of optical polarization to use. Dichroic mirrors are also used to control light through the process of thin film interference. This is done by applying several layers of metal oxides on the surface of glass. These layers are typically submicron in size and each layer reflects a portion of the total incoming light. Portions that match in phase with the reflections on other layers will result in some frequencies behaving like specular reflection, while the others are passed through the mirror. Thin film optics such as dichroic mirrors are commonly used for filtering light. They are often used for moving headlights and video projection systems for this application. Dichroic mirrors can also join sources of light together due to their ability to reflect and pass various wavelengths of light. This is used to create mixed sources of light in devices like show lasers and video projection systems. Dichroic X-cubes are a type of optic that uses multiple methods of splitting and combining light. These cubes are four joint right angle prisms. From one diagonal edge of the cube to the other in the cube is a dichroic layer that reflects blue at 90 degrees. This dichroic layer allows green and red to mostly pass. Polarization also plays a role in how X cubes work. In the cubes from edge to edge perpendicular to the dichroic layer, there is a thin film polarizing layer, which favors the total internal reflection of red. Using polarizing filters removes the waste light and leaves a nicer red and green. Green light is essentially unaffected by the X cubes optics. Since they are primarily used in LCD video projectors, they are made to take advantage of the polarization of light for mixing. Now that you have seen some of the skills that I practice, I hope that you have a better understanding and appreciation for light and the many ways humans create and control it. Light and its interactions are extremely complex and there is still so much I have to learn about it myself. I have no doubt that there is a continued journey in front of me, as well as misunderstandings of which I hope only a few has made it in this video. I hope you enjoyed watching and as always, stay tuned for more.